Good morning, and welcome to the third annual Yonkers Senior Law Day. This event is being brought to you by the Yonkers Senior Law Day Collaborative in partnership with the Yonkers Public Library and our broadcast host, the City of Yonkers. My name is Elena Falcone. I'm the Director of Public Innovation and Engagement at the Westchester Library System. I'm also a happy uh, co-chair of the, of the Senior Law Day Collaborative. There we go. I get to, um, to help to coordinate the work of the collaborative with two other people, Melinda Bellis of Legal Services of Hudson Valley and Sarah Steckler of Keenan Dean. Okay, I do say two other people, but in fact, it's an entire team of people, which includes our marketing consultant, Bruce Siegel, and a special advisor from Keenan Dean. In fact, one of the people who helped to create the Yonkers Senior Law Day project with the Senior Law Day project, Steve Shirkman. The Senior Law Day Collaborative is composed of more than 150 professionals who provide free workshops and consultations throughout the year on dozens of legal, financial, and health topics of relevance to older adults. We've been working pretty hard in, um, since the beginning of April to bring these topics to you in a different format because of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we have been doing this, this this program for more than 20 years in the county, but we've never been able, we've never had the opportunity to do this as robustly in a, in a video conferencing format. And so that's what you're getting today. Today, actually, we're going not just to um, video conference, but we're being broadcast live on local on local television and Yonkers, as well as Facebook Live. So we're using all the tools that we have available to us. A lot of the information that we're going to share today, you're going to be able to find on our website which is the key point of reference that I want you to, to remember as you go through this event and after and after it, it closes in, in, in two hours from now. Yonkers, um, the seniorlawday.info website. This site has all of the recordings of the webinars that we've been doing since the beginning of April. And you can see the topics that we've been covering on financial planning, getting wills done, housing laws, how to, um, how to manage um, issues related to domestic violence and, and elder abuse, elder law, selling your home in the midst of, a, of, of the COVID-19 challenges, Medicaid redesign. There is so much information here that is actually relevant to our current needs that I hope you will consider going back to this website and viewing those, those recordings on your own. We're gonna give you a sampling of a lot of this information today. In fact, I have challenged um, all of these speakers today to give their sort of top concerns in a rapid fire 15, 15 minute presentation. So you're going to be getting basically a taste of, of the senior law day collaborative and we do want you to follow up for more. Also note on the top of the screen, I'm showing you the top of our website page. There's a calendar of events. You can find out about upcoming programs. You can also find out about our elder law Q and A. We produce this document annually in both in English and Spanish, and it is an enduring reference tool that I, that I know can be of value to everyone who's listening to this program. After you hear this today, you have an opportunity to ask questions of the people who have been, have been presenting. Actually, you have an opportunity to tap into the expertise of all 150 plus professionals who are part of the Senior Law Day Collaborative. We regularly provide free educational workshops. We regularly provide free consultations. So we can get you started as you try to figure out these different, these different topics. When you go to our website, all you have to do is click the Ask Us button. On, when, when that happens, you'll, it'll, it'll pop open a window. You give us some basic contact information and the skeleton of what your question is. We will find out an answer for you. We will get the right person to talk to you. We'll call you back or we'll email you and we will help you out. The Senior Law Day Collaborative is an enduring resource for the entire Westchester community, and I hope you'll take advantage of it. So up first for, for this program is a, a speaker who's going to talk about scams, which have been rampant during, during this COVID-19 crisis. We want you to know what's, what's taking place and what you can beware. Thank you, Elena, and good morning, everybody. Uh, on behalf of Attorney General Letitia James, thanks for giving us the opportunity to warn about some of the more common scams that have developed in the heat of the coronavirus pandemic. Um, scammers tend to follow the headlines. So historically, after any great tragic event that occurs, be it 9-11 or a hurricane or a tornado or a, or a snowstorm, 
scammers come out of the woodwork and try to take advantage of consumers. And I think the basic concept to understand when it comes to scammers is that they're not so much trying to outsmart us, to trick us. They're trying to prey on our emotions. And boy, are we all feeling a lot of emotions right now, fear of getting coronavirus, fear of losing our jobs, fear of financial difficulty. There are lots of emotions that we're feeling that are fertile ground for scammers to try to take advantage of. Perhaps the most common phone scam we've ever seen in this country was called the IRS scam, where the car would say he was an IRS agent, you owe back taxes, and we're going to come and arrest you if you don't send us the money today. And of course, if you didn't know that call was a scam, you'd be fearful of being arrested by the IRS. We're all kind of scared of the IRS anyway, and so a lot of people would, would fall for it and send the money. Um, the grandparent scam, where the caller would say, he's your grandson, he's been arrested in a foreign country, he needs bail money real quick. The love of a grandparent is one of the strongest emotions on earth, and so oftentimes a grandparent would fall for that. And so the same kind of concept is what the scammers are going to try to use now to try to rip us off. And so let me start by talking about medical products. There is no product out there right now that treats or cures coronavirus, and yet the internet is chock full of websites that are offering bogus products. So please be aware of that. There's no FDA-approved vaccine. There's no FDA-approved treatment right now. There's no FDA-approved cure. So if someone's trying to sell you that, they're trying to rip you off. And it's not just being done on, a, on an international basis. It's even happening locally. Uh, the Westchester Regional Office of the Attorney General sent a cease and desist letter on May 20th to a spa in Yonkers, which was claiming that its regimen could both prevent and cure coronavirus, assuring that you would never wind up in the hospital if you took this regimen. Uh, so we've sent the cease and desist letter uh, to that operator. So please be aware of these claims. There's no such thing out there by definition. It's a claim they're just trying to prey uh, on your fear of getting coronavirus. When the pandemic first started, we were swamped with complaints about price gouging. Uh, people were being overcharged for items such as toilet paper, Lysol spray, hand sanitizer, all those kind of products that people all of a sudden wanted. The price on many of them skyrocketed. It was worst online, the worst price gouging took place online, but it did take place uh, in New York on, on a retail basis as well. We at the AG's office received over 5,000 price gouging complaints in the first month after the pandemic started. We issued about 1,500 cease and desist letters uh, statewide. We issued over 100 right here in Westchester to get companies to stop price gouging. That problem seems to have abated. We're getting many fewer complaints. It looks like the market has kind of stabilized when it comes to these products. So we're getting a fewer complaints about that than we were. But uh, if you do see price gouging, please let us know. I'll give contact information out in a couple of minutes on how to let us know about price gouging. We all wanna be generous in these times. We wanna uh, support our, our fellow uh, New Yorkers and our fellow United States uh, folks uh, by making charitable donations. And we should be charitable and we should be generous. The problem is that scammers are trying to take advantage of this by setting up bogus charity websites trying to get people to donate. They're sending text messages, they're sending email messages, they're making phone calls. Be very careful before you make a charitable donation. All charities in New York have to register with the Attorney General's office. You can go on our website, you'll see the web address in a couple of minutes, and see if a charity is registered. If it's not, you know that it's bogus. Uh, it's important that you be generous, but be careful before you make uh, a donation. A lot of us are feeling a financial pinch, and so this is an opportunity to, for scammers to offer investment-related opportunities, quote unquote, uh, to make money fast. But uh, if it sounds too good to be true, it is too good to be true. Do the same kind of research about an investment nowadays that you would do under normal circumstances. You'd call your broker, you'd go online and research it. You wouldn't just get a phone call probably, hopefully, and immediately make an investment over the phone. Um, the phone is probably the most common way that scammers are going to try to take advantage of us. So they're going to call up and they're going to say things like, I'm calling from the Social Security Administration. Uh, we want to make sure that you're eligible for benefits. Please confirm your Social Security number. They're going to call and say they're calling to uh, uh, get to verify your Social Security number before they can send you a stimulus check. They're going to call with all kinds of schemes and ruses to try to get you to give out personal information or sometimes to even pay money. So what we want you to do is we want you to think of the telephone as a one-way street. You give information out over the phone when you made the call to a number you know to be a legitimate number. The problem is when someone calls you, you can never really be sure they are who they say they are. No matter what they say, you can't believe it for sure. What they'll do to make it seem more believable is they'll use a technology called caller ID spoofing. 
they can make your caller ID, the scammers can say anything they want. So if the scammer's claiming he's from the IRS, he can make your caller ID say Internal Revenue Service or post the phone number of the IRS. The caller saying he's from the Social Security Administration, the same. So don't rely on caller ID. Uh, don't answer the phone. In fact, if you don't recognize the number, the safest thing is to not get on the phone in the first place. To trick us into answering the phone, they're using a new technique called neighbor spoofing. They spoof a caller ID number that's in your same area code and exchange, but with four other digits than your own number. And what they're hoping you're gonna think is that it's a local business or someone you know, you don't quite recognize the number and you're gonna answer the telephone on that basis. So beware of that. Just don't answer the phone at all right now unless you recognize the number. Is that perfect advice? No, you may miss a call that you wish you'd answered, but the car can leave a message and get back to you. The phone is not our friend right now. It can be the easiest way for a scammer to get money from us. When scammers ask for money from victims, up until a couple of years ago, what they used to tell people to do was to go to the bank or go to Western Union and wire the money. They stopped doing that largely because the banks and Western Unions have been training their tellers to warn people, if you walk in and you say, I got a call from the IRS, I need to wire the money, they're gonna warn you that that's a scam. So what the scammers had largely taken to doing was telling victims to go buy a gift card and call back with a serial number. That would allow the scammer to transfer the funds from the gift card you bought to their gift card without a trace, and it has become the method of choice that scammers are gonna use. Now, a lot of times nowadays, people are not gonna be comfortable going to a store to buy a gift card, but you can buy them online. And so you may come across a scammer who tells you to go online, buy a gift card, and then call back with a serial number. This is by definition a scam. Businesses are not permitted payment over the phone uh, by gift card. So if somebody tries to get you to buy a gift card and make a donation in that method or make a purchase by that method, don't fall for it. It's a scam. We're seeing te uh, text messages related to contact tracing. Contact tracing is now being used to follow people who are known to be infected with coronavirus to warn people they came in contact with so that those people can self-quarantine. So we're beginning to get calls from consumers who are saying, I'm getting text messages from people who say that they're a contact tracer and they want to know my social security number or they want to know my bank account number, they want other personal information about me. A contact tracer is never going to ask you for that type of information. So if you get a text message like that, beware, don't fall for it. People are telling us that they're getting calls from people claiming that they're working for the census. Of course, it's kind of been put to the sidelight in our public consciousness, but we're in the middle of the 2020 census. So people are getting calls from people saying, I'm with the census, I need your personal information, I need your social security number, or that there's a fee you've got to pay in connection with the census. That's a scam. So the scammers are going to try to do anything they can do to impersonate someone from the government to get you to think that you've got to act or there's going to be some bad consequence if you don't. The district attorney here in Westchester, Anthony Scarpino, put out a warning about text messages that people are receiving about job opportunities. You're getting a text that says, we've got a job for you, but they need your personal information. So be on the lookout for that. So the text messages are a method that's being used, and so are emails. And what they're hoping you'll do with an email is click on the link, which can then uh, download malware onto your computer. So if you get an unsolicited email and it's got an attachment on there or a link on there, be very, very careful about clicking on that, because if you do, you may uh, unleash malware onto your computer. The safer thing if you get an email like that is to simply go to the web and, and log on directly to contact that company without using the link in the, in the, in the, in the email. So for example, if you get an email and it says it's from the Internal Revenue Service, don't click on the link, go to irs.gov, contact them that way. Uh, don't fall for that kind of a scam. Uh, links are dangerous and uh, people need to be aware of them. Stimulus checks. A lot of people are getting stimulus checks and there are scams associated with that. People are calling up to say they need to get your social security number to confirm it or that there's a fee in connection with it. But it's, it's almost ironic that some people are thinking there's a stimulus check scam when it's a, the real thing. About 4 million people are receiving their stimulus payments by debit card. You get a debit card in the mail from the US Treasury. And we're so used to being warned that these are a scam that we've been getting dozens and dozens of calls. I know the Yonkers Office for the Aging has as well from people who have received debit cards in the mail and are afraid this is a scam, this is not legitimate, and hopefully they're not, or they're thinking that it's junk mail and they're just throwing it out. But please bear in mind that the federal government is sending out stimulus payments by debit card. If you get a card like that, don't throw it out. It's not junk mail, it's legitimate. Uh, and so uh, be careful of that. 
So we're here to help. If you need to contact the Attorney General's office, you can call us toll free at 1-800-771-7755. And you see our web address down at the bottom there. You can file a complaint online and that's really what we're encouraging you to do right now if you can, because we're working remotely. So our ability to process and handle online complaints that we receive is faster. We can get to your complaint faster than if you put it in the mail. But if you do put it in the mail, we will get to it and we will process it. You don't need a particular complaint form. Any letter you send us is fine. It doesn't have to be on a complaint form. Just tell us what your problem is and we'll do our best to help you. I wanna conclude by mentioning what's become the most common complaint that we're receiving at the AG's office. And this is gonna be a huge issue going forward over the next few months. And those are cancellation refund complaints. Complaints from consumers who bought tickets to events, booked hotels, booked catering halls for parties, et cetera, that have been canceled and they can't get their money back, but they want a refund. Please let us know. We'll do our best if we can. Uh, we've already gotten a couple of major health club chains to stop billing consumers while the clubs are closed during the pandemic. Uh, but we're also getting complaints from people who paid in advance and can't get their money back. So if that's happened to you, please reach out to us either by phone or online and we'll do our best to help you. So thanks very much, Elena. Let me throw it back to you. I'm both, I'm both moved and distressed by the amount of activity that is taking place that you guys have to have to address, but I'm so grateful that you are, that you're, that you're looking out for us. Um, so everyone knows the, the information we're sharing today in print is posted to the seniorlawday.info website. So you can go back and review the tips that Gary just shared and access these these phone numbers and web addresses. Okay. Next up, we have um, we have a demonstration for you. We're going to talk about COVID nineteen prevention tips, especially while shopping. Karen Ronan, please take please take the floor. Hi, good morning, everybody. Good morning, Westchester County. My name is Karen Ronan, and I'm a registered nurse, and I am a geriatric care manager. I've been a nurse for 25 years and have seen many different, uh, not a pandemic obviously, but uh, different health issues that have arise that affect our community. So I'm here today to just share a couple of tips on how to keep yourself safe during these times. First off, I'd like to talk a little bit about people's behavior. You know, everyone reacts very differently. We all have different emotions. Some of us are more scared than others. Think about yourself during these times. It's okay to be a little selfish. Don't worry about what other people are doing. Is their mask on? Is their mask off? Why are they doing that way? Why are we doing it this way? Just, I'm here to give you some tips on how to keep you safe, most importantly. So when you're online in the grocery store, think about distance, right? People forget often, people like to be close to each other. We're not used to standing six feet apart. So give yourself some distance. If someone's too close and you feel comfortable to say, can you please back up two feet? That would make me feel comfortable. Go ahead, do that. If you don't, then make sure your back is to a person. Don't be face to face. And again, think about yourself. Visitors, family. Can you see your family and visitors? Again, you have to think along what is safe for you. Can you see somebody outdoors and keep a big distance between yourselves? Keep your masks on? That is probably a possibility now. But again, speak with your healthcare providers and your doctors of what is the safest thing for you and your family. So proper face coverings. A new study just came out last week. What's the best face covering? Well, it turns out that the N95 mask, a surgical mask or a scarf actually gives you the same protection. Let's remember by wearing a face covering is by protecting the world, not just yourself. The biggest thing that you can do to protect yourself is to wash your hands often and regularly. And when you're not near soap and water, Use hand sanitizer. That works well. So what are good masks to wear? Anything that doesn't have a vent. We see a lot of people walking around these days that has a little vent on the side. Those are letting air out. That's what we want to avoid. Ladies, you have a pretty scarf. You can wear a scarf and then 
voila. You can just pull the scarf over your, your face and not have to worry about a mask. Where do we contract the disease? It also has shown that surfaces are not as dangerous as we thought. That doesn't mean we want to disregard it, but the biggest contamination is standing close to each other, our hands to our face, eyes, nose. That's how we get infected. So keep your distance, wear your face mask, take care of yourselves, be slightly selfish. It's okay today. So here is a quick demonstration. If you choose to use gloves, again, gloves are our friend, but they can also be our enemy. Just remember, it is just a covering of your own hand. That doesn't mean that you don't wash your hands or you don't use sanitizer. Sometimes when we use gloves, we cannot think about, or we forget to think about where our hands are going because we think we have an extra protective layer. So here we are. So we have our gloves. You hold it to the side on the rim. Put one hand in. Pretty easy. Put another hand on. Then we're going to put on our mask. If you choose to use a surgical mask, there is a bendy part on the top. This bendy rim has to go above your nose because you want to make sure that it stays nice and tight against your nose. Oops. Put both loops behind your nose, pull down under your chin, and make sure that top piece is nice and tight. Now we're ready to go to the supermarket. So here we are, we're in the supermarket, we're walking around. Try and act as normally as you can. Pick up the items you need, put them in your basket, Keep your gloves on until you unload your groceries from the cart and you're about to get ready into get ready to get into your car. So, what do we do first? We're going to take off our gloves. The easiest way to do it is to pinch, pinch the palm. Most people do this where they push their finger in and up you can be putting bacteria across your wrist and into your palm, and those are the most common areas that get missed when you're washing your hands. So again, pinch the palm and pull the glove straight off. Now you're holding this glove. Now you can gently pull the other glove over this glove, and you have a nice little package deal. Bring a Ziploc bag along with you so you can discard these gloves. Let's think about the environment. We can bring this home safely by just putting it in a Ziploc bag and then zipping it off and put it in your trunk. Leave everything in your trunk out of your car. Keep your car clean. Now, we still have our masks on. That comes off last. We take our hand sanitizer, rub really good. Make sure to get in these creases across your wrist and between your fingers. And also don't forget the back of your hands, right? So now if we take our masks off, there's two ways of doing it. The best way is to take both loops and come straight off. Pull everything away from your face. If that, if you have a dexterity problems or that's just too much for you to do, then take one loop off and open it like a door. Again, this manages so that it goes away from your face. Please try not to do this. This seems okay, but the bacteria or the, or the virus can be on the outside of the mask and then can travel up towards your face. So again, it's best to take it off, put it in that Ziploc bag. When you take your mask off, rewash your hands one more time you're ready to get in your car, your hands are clean, you drive home. You can then repeat the procedure with the gloves. It's not necessary to put the mask back on because you're not in contact with people. Again, remember the mask is to help diminish the spread of the virus. Once you're in your home, 
There are many different ways to disinfect your fruit. You can wash your fruit with soap and water. Please don't put chemicals on your fruit. That, you know, we don't know that that goes away. It can, you can ingest it very easily. So to take all precautions in your home, disinfectants, Lysol, soap and water will all take care of the viruses on surfaces. So I'll leave you with always choose the outdoors over indoors. Always choose masking over non-masking. Always choose more states and fewer people than smaller spaces. Stay healthy and stay safe. Take care, Westchester. Thank you so much, Karen. Uh, everyone should know that we've posted a uh, snippet of your um, explanation of how to use a mask and gloves to the seniorlawday.info website because it's that useful. Again, thank you. We have a program about um, what you need to know about the new housing laws. We gave a webinar on this a couple of weeks ago, and it is it was a solid hour of excellent information. We've asked our presenter to summarize this information in about 15 minutes. Good morning. Thank you, Elena. Uh, so I have very good news if you're a tenant if, who rents an apartment or if you're someone who's looking to rent an apartment. Last year, Governor Cuomo signed the Housing Stability and Tenant Protection Act of 2019. This law improved the protections to tenants dramatically. I am going to give you just a taste of what uh, was done in the next 10 minutes or so. However, as Elena just said, last uh, month, or no, it was in April, uh, my colleague Marcy Kobach and I both presented on this for one hour. There's a lot of information. So I encourage you, if you're interested in hearing more after my short presentation, to go on the seniorlawday.info website and hear and see the full webinar. Uh, in addition, if you are a tenant experiencing any legal problems, I also encourage you to please contact our office at Legal Services at the Hudson Valley at the number that you'll be seeing on the upcoming slides. And with that, I will begin. Uh, so for the first slide, it's going to be about starting a landlord-tenant relationship. Uh, after that, I'm going to talk about the landlord-tenant relationship itself and then how a landlord-tenant relationship becomes terminated. But to begin with, when looking for an apartment, some one of the great improvements is that you cannot be charged with, with extra fees and extra security deposits. A landlord cannot charge anything but one month security and the fees for a credit and background check. No application fees or deposit or last month's rent. And the fees for a credit and background check are limited to the lesser of the actual cost of pulling the report or $20. The applicant must get a copy of the report and an invoice. And if you, the applicant brings their own recent report, then no fee can be charged. So just to sum that up one more time, remember that if you are looking for an apartment, if you find an apartment, keep in mind, you can only be charged one month security and the fee for the credit and background check, which cannot exceed $20. Also, between the lease signing and the move-in, the tenant must be given an opportunity for a walkthrough in the apartment to note damages. This is also important for when you leave later. If there are any issues in the apartment that were never repaired and were noted at this time, you cannot be held responsible for them and the landlord cannot withhold the security deposit. So for the next slide, we're gonna talk about the landlord-tenant relationship itself. Some new improvements. If a tenant pays by personal check and they make a written request for a receipt, they have to get a receipt, not only for that payment, but for every subsequent payment that they make by personal check while they are a tenant. In the past, you needed to request a receipt each time. But now, if you request the receipt once, the landlord's on notice that you want it each time you pay your rent by personal check. 
also, when a tenant delivers the rent in person, they need to get a receipt immediately. For mail or other ways, the landlord or management has to give a receipt with 15 days of receiving, within 15 days of receiving the payment. Every receipt must include the date, the amount paid, the apartment number, the month being paid, and the title of the person who accepted the rent and their signature. This is very important because we do see a lot of cases where people are brought to court and they're told they didn't pay rent for a specific month. And it's very important to, when you pay the rent, to put down the month that you are paying the rent for to make sure that that is what is applied and it's not applied to anything else. And again, when you get your receipt, it should reflect that correct date, the amount paid, and the apartment number and the month that you are paying for. Also, late fees cannot be charged until the rent is five days late and they're capped at the lesser of 5% or $50. So you should never receive a late charge for paying the rents less than five days late. And the late fee, if you do pay it more than five days late, should not exceed 5% of the monthly rent or $50. Okay. In addition, the new law applies for much better notice if your landlord is intending to increase the rent. In the past, the law was 30 days notice for most tenancies, for rent-stabilized tenancies, 90 to 120 days in advance. Now, the law has been changed so that if you're living in your apartment for less than a year, you need to be given 30 days notice of a rent increase. If you've lived in the apartment for six for two years, between one and two years, 60 days notice. And if you live in your apartment for more than two years, 90 days notice before the landlord could increase the rent. This applies even if you're living in an apartment without a lease on a month to month basis. This is very important because a lot of landlords, especially landlords who are uh, held in private homes where people don't have leases, will try to orally raise the rent and give very little notice for it. So to go over that one more time, the notice of the rent increase for a month to month tenant who's lived in the premises less than a year would be 30 days. If you're a tenant with a written lease who's lived in your apartment for a full year, or a tenant with or without a written lease who's lived at the premises for a full year, but less than two years, you must be given 60 days notice. A tenant with a written lease for two years or more needs to be given 90 days notice before the rent can be increased. And a tenant who's lived in the apartment for more than two years without a written lease also needs to be given more than 90 days notice. And now, when it comes to ending the landlord-tenant relationship, the landlord must give notice of a non-renewal for a lease, including terminating a month-to-month -month tenancy. Again, just as you needed to get adequate notice if the rent was going to be increased, the new law provides for adequate notice if the tenancy is being terminated. It goes by the length of residency. So if you've lived in the apartment for under a year, you need to be given 30 days notice before your lease can be terminated. 60 days notice if you've lived in your apartment for one to two years, and 90 days notice for two years or above. And again, this applies to whether you have a written lease or not. Also, the landlord must schedule a walkthrough one week before the vacate date to note any damage. If a detailed list of why the security was withheld is not given in 14 days, a landlord cannot retain the security. This is very important. There's so many people who come to us because the landlords do not return the security deposit. So again, Important to note, you're entitled to a walkthrough before you leave 
and the landlord should tell you about any damages in front in that walkthrough. If you don't get a list within 14 days, you have to get the full security deposit back. Finally, the landlord, if, if you break the lease, the landlord has to try to re-rent the apartment in good faith before suing you for the unexpired term of the lease if the tenant leaves early. So a landlord would have the burden in court if if you break the lease, the landlord has to show that they tried to the best efforts possible to rent the apartment and were unable to. Also something to know is that for seniors who leave their apartment and break a lease to go to an assisted living facility or nursing home or some sort of low income senior housing, they are permitted to break their lease with no penalty. So again, this is a taste. It's very hard to give you all of the highlights. There's a lot of improvements. There's improvements for tenants who are facing evictions. And I encourage you to go to the Senior Law Day Info website to learn more. Thank you. Thanks, Elena. Melinda, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Is there any one topic that you would want to add because you did such a good job of summarizing? Um, I would let people know that there are no evictions in place through June 20th. However, after that date, it's unclear what can happen. If someone is not paying their rent because of they were affected by the COVID-19 in some way, that they lost their job or that they themselves were sick or in some other way, perhaps a family member that they need to take care of, then their tenancy is protected through the end of August. But does the way the law is worded, it does not prevent landlords from taking tenants to court on non-payment proceedings where they will then have the burden of proving that the reason they didn't pay their rent it was because it was related to COVID. So it's um, everyone should stay alert if they are, um, if they do receive papers to go to court, which Again, we don't know when that will start up again, but technically it could start up by the end of this month now that we're in June. So be alert about that. And again, feel free to call our office, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley at the number below. They're, they are everywhere in Yonkers these days and they wanna make sure that you know that they're here for you. I'm Kelly Chiarella. I'm the director for Yonkers Office for the Aging. I first want to say thank you so much for this opportunity to be a partner for Senior Law Day. Um, it's a, it's wonderful that we weren't we weren't in need of canceling this very important event and offering the information that so many people need, especially now, in a new, creative, innovative way. Um, so. I also want to just thank Elena Falcone for organizing all this every year, along with the Yonkers Public Library. It's a wonderful event and very, very important to our seniors. So I'm um, moving away from the topic of law just a little bit. I just want to talk about Office for the Aging and take this opportunity. Uh, Yonkers Office for the Aging, located at Riverdale Avenue. Our phone number is 377-6823, 377-6823. I say that because you can call us for anything. We take care of the seniors in Yonkers that are 60 years and older. Basically, you can call for anything. There are no silly questions. We offer case management, home health aids, transportation. We typically have four congregate sites, which of course are closed right now. Transportation is also on hold. We do home delivered meals to many of the seniors in the city. Home delivered meals are served to 60 years and over, frail, disabled, homebound, um, not able to cook for yourself, not able to shop for yourself, and uh, have no local support. So if you can be assessed for the home delivered meals program. If you do not qualify for the home delivered meals program, we are currently, during this COVID situation, delivering pantry boxes for those that are still able to cook and aren't qualified for the other home delivered meals. Since we began the shelter in place in Yonkers, um, we, Yonkers Office for the Aging has delivered over 21,000 home delivered meals and almost 10,000 pantry boxes. The home delivered meals are using my staff, my drivers and my escorts, 
who have remained on board since the beginning, and the pantry boxes, which are happening right now, it has been organized and supported by the National Guard and by volunteers, mostly from the Yonkers Fire Department. So um, we are offering an enormous amount of support in that way in regards to food to make sure that we can keep our seniors in their homes as much as possible and out of the supermarkets. We offer information and assistance uh, on every single topic. Many of the different people that are on this webinar with us today are partners of ours, and we reach out to them often. As Gary mentioned, we've been talking recently about some of the scams and some of the fears that people have had. So if you call our office and you want support with, with anything and you don't know where to reach out to, please just give us a call. We also help with paratransit applications, HEAP applications, SCREE, housing applications, Medicaid assistance, and much, much, much more. So like I said, no silly questions. Feel free to call us. Right now, um, as we move forward, we're looking at creative ways to be able to open up our congregate lunch sites again. Of course, it's going to take some guidance from the from the um, governor's office on how many people we'll be, we'll be allowed to have in each space. But we're also looking at outdoor spaces, as well as the Yonkers Parks Department is also looking at doing a lot of things outside. So in the beginning, we may start off with something like a buddy lunch system and keeping the numbers very low inside of our centers and low inside of the vans that will be transporting people. And then hopefully be able to grow and grow and grow until we're completely back to normal. But I know that's very important to a lot of people that attend our four congregate lunch centers that they get back to the centers and see their friends. Just please know that we are working on that and we are working on guidance. It may require a reservation system, but we will be getting that moving very, very soon. Looking forward to seeing you all. Um, the other thing is transportation. Of course, um, anyone that uses our transportation knows that it's a 12 passenger van, you have to be able to physically get on and off of the band, van to um, use our transportation. It's a, it's a suggested donation of $1. Um, it's only for City of Yonkers. Um, so with transportation, because they're smaller vans, again, we're gonna wait for some guidance on how many people will be allowed to ride in the van while also making sure that my drivers are safe up front. So we offer medical transportation, shop transportation to shopping, usually in groups. Again, that may change just a bit. And then transportation to come to the four congregate lunch sites. In the four congregate lunch sites, we usually offer presentations and exercise classes and different, um, and different activities. Right now, all of those activities are actually still happening, but they're happening virtually. So if you're interested and you're, you're bored at home and you're looking for something to do, you can call the office. There are so many opportunities happening similar to this today. We are currently doing conference calls, conference call bingo and conference call presentations for some of our more frail, older clients that don't know how to Zoom and don't know how to get onto Facebook Live. But we're also doing Zoom bingo and Zoom with the support of the library and working with our NORC program. We're working with Zoom Bingo and Zoom Chair Yoga and Zoom Zumba and many, many, many other activities. And we're also partnering in advertising for Dorote. Dorote has many social activities, University Without Walls, Telephone Reassurance, and so many other things. So again, if you're interested in being social while at home, while we need to maintain our safety, please just give our office a call and talk to them about what you're interested in. Make sure you tell them what you're interested in because it'll help just guide the conversation. Some people want to volunteer. Family Service Society of Westchester is still looking for volunteers, and there may be other opportunities through Volunteer New York. Some people um, just are looking for something to have a, a chat, just have a talk with some of their friends, and we're able to coordinate some of those things for you as well. I'm looking forward to getting back to normal. I'm looking forward to seeing everybody's faces. Um, just please know Yonkers Office for the Aging is still here for you. So we're still offering case management. We're still doing the home health aids. We're still doing um, application assistance. It's just in a different fashion. But call the office. We, we've been there since the beginning. A team of my people have been in the office since the beginning. So looking forward to seeing everybody. I want to, again, thank Elena for this opportunity.
Kelly, thank you. Thank you so much. I have to acknowledge that the partnership with the Yonkers Office of the Aging, as well as the Yonkers Public Library, has made programs like this in Yonkers just so, so successful. I, too, look forward to, I guess it's going to be next June, um, when we'll be able to have another full day event at the Yonkers Will Library or the Yonkers Riverfront Library. Those live events, um, while we're, you know, experimenting with this with this platform have been well attended. And I, although I do think that given the size of Yonkers, one of the things that we may try to find a way to do is to continue to offer some sort of video conference access so that um, people from any part of Yonkers can can participate easily, but also that only works with your help. So thank you so much for that. Okay, so next up we have the top three issues in elder law and special needs planning. As you can imagine, these are com these are complicated topics that we've asked people to present on. So our next speaker is has is stepping up to the challenge, and she's going to talk about these these issues. I think I've given her a whole twenty minutes to summarize. You can find her slides on seniorlawday.info. Thank you very much, Elena. My name is Maura Laidlaw. I'm an attorney in Westchester County, and I start with that as my introduction because one of the most important things in tackling elder law issues is to make sure that you work with, with a lawyer. And this isn't a completely self-serving statement, I swear. It really is about um, complicated legal issues and a moment in time to solve them, them correctly. So the first concept I want to just really instill is that the people who plan ahead of time navigate the harder moments in life in a much legally simpler way. And when things are legally simpler, it means that they cost a lot less. And so later in the program, there's going to be a much more detailed discussion, uh, especially of the advanced directives component of this slide. But the things that everyone should be thinking about having at a minimum, once they are over the age of 18, is a really good power of attorney, healthcare document, and a will. Because once we, once we turn 18 years of age, that's when our parents lose the natural decision-making authority over us. And then what I say to my clients is, the more over the age of 18 we are, the more important it is that we really tend to these things. So none of us can time when we might lose, lose capacity, but the, unfortunately, the older we get, the higher at risk we are for an event that, that could lead to a loss of capacity. And it's when we lose legal capacity that we no longer have the ability to plan. You know, we, we, we don't understand the nature and consequences of what, we're, what we're, we're looking at at that point. And so we're not able to sign legal, le legal documents then. So during this, this period of COVID-19 and the sheltering in place, I have received more calls from people who've meant to get to this on their to-do list. You know, I, I'm recently in the 50 and, um, and over age category, and it, it came as a shock with COVID-19 to suddenly find myself in a high risk category. So I think several people are realizing just that we can't take things for granted. And these are the things that, that we need to do. And the reason why planners win is because when we don't plan, then we need court-based solutions to all of these, these items on this list. So uh, again, I'm sure Sarah Myers later in the program will, will, will be talking about this, but if you think of spending a little bit of money ahead of time versus having to go to court and having a guardianship proceeding for yourself, for example, that's that's why the healthcare directives and financial directives in in particular are very important. And what I've discovered in this chapter again of court closings during COVID-19 is how instrumental trust planning has 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 been. So trusts are a way to transfer assets ahead of time and they can be revocable or they can be irrevocable. With revocable trusts, 
the main purpose is to have a consolidated asset management, but there's no protection that comes from the assets. Um, but very seamless transition upon incapacity or death for anything held in a revocable trust, because anything held by that, that, that trustee doesn't need court intervention upon incapacity or death. And with the surrogates courts understandably having to cease most of its operations in the last few months in order to protect themselves and the public, wills were not able to be filed or processed during this, this particular time period. It's starting to open up now for COVID related deaths. Um, but again, we had a good two to two and a half month period of abatement with any court processing. So families that had used revocable trust planning were able to continue to, to administer any assets, you know, sell a house, collect a bank account, reinvest in an investment account. So that's really a great thing that revocable trusts can be used for. There are commentators out there on the radio, like Susie Orman. I call her my, my frenemy sometimes because I, she, she really talks so much about revocable trusts that that's what's on most of my clients' minds when they walk into my office. But where the real asset protection planning, especially in New York, can happen is more in the area of irrevocable trusts. So if you own a home, for example, in Westchester, you can create an irrevocable trust with certain provisions and with the help of an elder law lawyer. And that trust now owns the home. And if you need to access Medicaid home care or nursing home care, the equity in that home is now protected. Depending on when, you transferred it to trust. So the next tip is to understand that Medicaid is the health insurance that's going to provide coverage of long-term care expenses. This slide truly is its own 45 minute lecture, but big picture, there are three ways to pay for long-term care expenses. The first, is to purchase long-term care insurance. Um, and again, people in my age cohort, early 50s, we should all be looking at this as a potential solution to, to help with our expenses, we hope down the road 20 to 30 years from now, because who knows really what Medicaid New York will be able to offer at that point in time. But for the time being, I'm very proud to call myself a, a New Yorker with respect to our state Medicaid program. We have one of the best programs in the country. The reason why is because we offer not just nursing home care through our state Medicaid program, but we offer the ability to get 24 hours of home care through our state Medicaid program. No other state, to my knowledge, offers this kind of robust home care benefit. It's truly something that helps our, our fellow New Yorkers age in place. No one ever walks into my office and says, Maura, I'm really trying to get a room in the, local, in, the, in, in the local nursing home center, and I won't even pick on anyone, you know? Like universally, I think we, we can all agree that nursing homes are there as, you know, to help with short-term rehab and as and a sort of a last resort for long-term care that can't be safely managed in a home environment. And so long-term care insurance is the first way to pay for that. Um, but many of my, of my clients in their 70s, 80s, 90s, if they haven't purchased long-term care insurance already, it's going to be very hard for them to get out of underwriting and obtain it. Or if they do get out of underwriting and are deemed insurable, the premiums can sometimes be very uneconomical. So the next way to finance long-term care is through Medicare. And most of my clients, by the time they get in my office, have been navigating Medicare really well. And they're pretty familiar with its strengths and weaknesses. 
they understand that it covers doctors and hospitals visits and with Part D prescription benefits. And they are truly acutely aware of its deficits in long-term care. Um, at most, Medicare is going to pay 100 days in a nursing home. It's a statutory maximum per benefit period. Um, but more commonly, the full benefit isn't available because Medicare is health insurance. It's about getting people better. So the Medicare component of that nursing home stay is for the short-term rehab. So once the center determines that you're no longer a proper candidate for the short-term rehab, that's when the Medicare component ends. So many of my families that we work with think that they have the full 100 days that they can count on. Um, and I always tell them, it's not a given, stay in constant contact with the treatment team about when the Medicare part of that stay is going to end and when the family member is going to transition likely to private pay or a, dis, a, dis, a discharge plan home. So that's Medicare's nursing home benefit. With Medicare's home care benefit, Medicare only provides skilled care. And so if you think of having a significant operation at a hospital, being discharged home, and VNS visiting every, you know, every few days to check on vitals and wound care. That is, is, is truly the extent of Medicare's home care benefit. It is not designed as a long-term care program. And so that leaves our third most robust option of New York Medicaid. New York Medicaid is a partnership with the federal government. So many of its rules that it imposes are federally required in order to receive funding. So to receive federal funding, New York nursing home benefit has to apply a five year look back. It doesn't mean you're not eligible for five years if you fall within something in this area, but it means they're gonna look at all of your financial and asset transfer transactions within the five years before you apply. And what they are looking for are gifts. In Medicaid language, they call it uncompensated transfers. And so one of the top things for you to understand is how important it is to plan ahead of time and to potentially utilize one of those irrevocable trusts at a moment in time where you're concerned about long-term care, but don't have a current need you do find that you or a loved one has a current need, there are still asset protection planning possibilities. It's just that they come with a little bit more risk and they also typically are not gonna protect all of the assets, but will, but will protect half of them. And that's not bad. You know, many people come into my office and they think that they've completely are gonna lose everything. And they are really relieved when I tell them that they're still going to be able to protect half. Well, Home Care New York has traditionally, and, and Deep's gonna be covering this in more, in more detail, some changes. Historically, New York never imposed a look back for home care. That was a federal rule that the federal government only required be imposed for nursing home care. Know that in Connecticut and New Jersey, they always impose that five year rule onto home care. And Deep's going to be talking in more detail about the new two and a half year look back in, in, in home care. But roughly, what's I think what's most amazing, in, and I think of my own parents in this, in this regard, my mom was a nurse for over 50 years, and my dad was a teacher. And, and they really, aging in place was very important for the two of them. And they were able to do it with the benefit of home care. So home care and getting unskilled care at home to assist with activities of daily living is what New York Medicaid really distinguishes its, its, itself on. The reason, in my opinion though, that you need a lawyer to navigate it is that there are around eight component parts to a home care medication application in order to, to get to the end of it with a Medicaid card and a home care authorization. 
And I'm not generally a cynical person, but the harder it is to navigate it, then the less New York State has to pay. And so I think that as the program has evolved and developed over the years, it has a great public policy behind it, but it's designed, in my, in my opinion, for any one family to fail. So be sure to get good counsel. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about my own credentials for one moment, so you know just what generally to look for. So as Elena said, we are all members of a, of a, of a collaborative that's focused on senior law issues. So look for a lawyer who's engaged in the community. I do work for the Women's Bar Association and County Bar with respect to trust and estates and elder law issues. And Deep and I both serve on an executive committee of the State Bar on elder law and special needs planning. Um, I have a team of lawyers and we probably work with 300 families a year on elder law issues. So those are the kinds of credentials that, that you wanna look for as you're looking for an elder law attorney. Because especially if there's any kind of early cognitive issue that you or a family member is struggling with, sometimes families only have one opportunity to get it right in terms of implementing the right plan. And there are consults I have in my office that I really find to be heartbreaking where the family will tell me, like, I don't understand. I thought I did this, 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 this planning a few years ago when my spouse was first diagnosed with, with, with Alzheimer's. But just as, as, as lawyers, we are all trained in, in, in different things. And so look for a lawyer who's really living and breathing these, these particular issues. All right, and so I've been talking a lot about senior issues and Elena, if you could go to my last slide, I'll be rather, um, just to say, all of this applies not just to seniors, but to anyone who presents with significant special needs. And so if you're caring for someone who might have been even born with a developmental disability, know that it's really important to plan on how to protect and support that, that person when you are no longer here. And again, just that concept of planners win resonates throughout all of this. So there's a tremendous difference in how our, our Medicaid and other means tested programs treat money that is left in what's known as a third party special needs trust as opposed to a first party. Um, and I have a family member who has a son who is severely autistic. So I'll just talk about my own family in that one context. For my brother and his and his wife, incredibly important that in their own estate planning documents, that they that they created a special needs trust for the benefit of their son. If they hadn't, and something happened to them, then their son would directly own their assets, and he would have to use or have a legal representative in his case implement a first party special needs trust. So big picture, a third party is created with the parent's money or the loved one's money for the benefit of someone with special needs. Whereas a first party special needs trust, it's already that, that person's money and they now have to pivot and try to quickly protect it so it's not lost or doesn't make them ineligible. And the hardest part really is actually applying for benefits. And so try to access benefit programs early, get as much information as soon as, as possible. There are other related programs out there. So those are, I think, the key top three issues in elder law and special needs planning. Laura, thank you. Thank you so much. And um, I really get the message that planners win. So you were, so you were successful in that. And I really appreciated the I love New York moment. Uh, I, 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 I too am proud to be in this state and I'm, and if, uh, this is, the, this is, this is the state where I'm hoping to continue to live out my life for all of the reasons you were, you were kind of framing up earlier. Thank you so much. And I guess expanding on some of, on some of this with um, news about recent changes in the laws is, is going to be uh, another 
another attorney who with, with, with great expertise. I want to make sure that he's he's ready to um, to step up. There's a lot that's been going on just recently. So uh, deep, please uh, take the stage. Hi, good morning. Thank you, Elena. You can hear me, right? Everybody, everybody can hear me. Yes, and now we can see you. Yay. Okay, good. Oops. Great. Okay, thanks a lot uh, uh, for that introduction. Thanks uh, to Maura for really setting the stage for me uh, for to talk about some of the, the really important changes to the Medicaid program. Um, my name is Deep Mukherjee. I'm an attorney in White Plains, New York. So, uh, and, and as Maura said, I'm active with the, the elder law section of the New York State Bar Association, uh, among other groups. And, uh, and I've been active with this group for a long time too. So, uh, all right, so I, I'm here to talk about big changes in the Medicaid program. There were huge changes in the Medicaid program uh, that, that specifically affect long-term care for seniors. Um, so what happened this year was a little different from prior years. Uh, the governor uh, decided that he needed to save $2.5 billion from the Medicaid program. And um, the way he did this was he got a panel together that was called the Medicaid Redesign Team 2. Um, and so this, this group put together about 50 recommendations and those recommendations uh, were then submitted to the legislature. Not all of them were incorporated into law, but remember this was to save $2.5 billion so that these were cuts to the program. Um, and, and what I'm gonna talk about are the four most significant changes uh, that occurred to the long-term care program, okay? And, and they will, they're gonna affect people who are applying for Medicaid. They're gonna affect people who are on Medicaid. So, uh, so it, it was a pretty major, it was a pretty major change this year. Uh, so these are the four main changes, okay? Uh, there are now transfer penalties uh, and a 30 month look back period for home care Medicaid. Remember, Maura just said that there was this, these transfer penalties and a, a, a 60-month look back uh, for, for nursing home care, but there was never anything before this for home care. So, so now there's going to be a 30-month look back for home care. Um, and now, if you're applying to the, the managed long-term care or you get most of your Medicaid services through uh, uh, for home care, uh, if you're applying for that managed long-term care program, you uh, now must need assistance with two activities of daily living. Uh, if you have a diagnosis of dementia, then it's one. Um, if, uh, so that's, that's the second one. There's, this was never required before. Assistance with two activities of daily living. The, the third thing is uh, the law calls for a development uh, of a new home care assessment uh, and evaluation program, all right? Currently, things are done by, you know, there, there are physician recommendations, uh, there's nursing assessments, uh, but, you know, they're, they're done by private agencies, by licensed home care agencies uh, and, and, and uh, certified home health agencies, things like that. So there's this nursing, there are these nursing assessments. Now there's going to be uh, the development of a new system uh, and one contractor statewide who's going to be performing all of these assessments. And there's also going to be a new tool, a, a new assessment system that will that will be in place. Uh, all right. And the fourth change I'm going to talk about uh, is that they have called for a review, a review of high utilization cases. All right. So cases and, and they didn't set a number. However, the, the Medicaid redesign team, the MRT2, said uh, that we should probably, they should be looking at cases that got over 12 hours of care a day. So, so potentially any case that's getting more than 12 hours a day would be reviewed. All right. Um, the next slide, great, thank you. Uh, all right, so what, what is this look back period? Well, when you apply for Medicaid, you have to submit, and you will now, this is effective October 2020. Uh, you will now have to submit um, 30 months of financial documentation, and they're going to review it. They're going to look for any transfers for less than fair market value or for gifts. 
And uh, if, if those are there, then this will result in a potential penalty for Medicaid. Um, and so what does that mean? All right, well, what that means is that, the, that they're gonna look at these 30 months. If they find transfers, they that a person is otherwise eligible for care, all right? If they're otherwise eligible for care, then uh, they are going to take a look at how much was transferred and they're going to apply a divisor. And the divisor is the regional rate for nursing homes uh, in, um, in in New York or in this area, I'm sorry, this re the, the Westchester, the Mid-Hudson Valley area. Right now it's 12,805, all right? That's the number that they would use. So if you transferred, if you gifted 12,805, what would happen is that you would get a one month penalty period, all right? Meaning that Medicaid will not pay for applying. You have to apply for it, but Medicaid will then say, we will not pay for one month, all right? And this is similar. So if you, if you transferred $128,000, it would be like 10 months of penalty, all right? So um, this, this would then, when does penalty period start, okay? This is the, this is the really tricky part, uh, and, and I don't really have answers. Uh, in terms of this, because some of this, I think, is still uh, needs to be clarified. There, there may be additional laws needed. As it stands, uh, remember, I said that this program, that this starts, the new look back will start on October 2020. All right, October 2020. So that means that applications filed after October 1st, 2020, will have to submit the 30 months look back. All right, now, in terms of, of figuring out when they, how far back they're going to look, well, it's going to go back from October 2020. This is the way the law is currently written. So currently, what it says is that that you go back from October 1st, 2020. You could go back two and a half years. So you're going, you know, you're you're going back potentially to 2018, uh, and transfers that were made at that time could result in a penalty period. Uh, that would affect you going forward, uh, you know, and, and we've been trying to change that at this, the Bar Association. A lot of people have been trying to fix this because we don't think it's fair that if you made a, a transfer in 2018 when it was perfectly fine uh, to do so and there was no law in place uh, that would have penalized you, uh, it, it's unfair to you to, to be penalized now. So that's going to be the question, you know, that's a question um, that still needs to be answered by uh, by the state uh, with respect to that, but uh, but you know we believe that transfers after October 2020 should be what's what are penalized. Um, anyway, so so that's that's sort of what the penalty period means. Uh, it starts when does the penalty start? Well, it starts when you're otherwise eligible, meaning you apply for care. You're eligible. You're otherwise eligible for Medicaid. Also, the law says that you have to be receiving home care services. All right, you have to be receiving home care services, uh, and and it's not really clear. It says that you know you have to be receiving services that Medicaid would ordinarily pay for, uh, would otherwise be paying for. Now, since a lot of these programs, especially the managed long term care program, is only available to Medi Medicaid recipients, it's really not clear what we're going to do about this because you can't get Medicaid services until you're on Medicaid. But if you got a penalty, you know, if you transferred assets, then you can't get on the program. So it's a little bit of a catch 22. Uh, and, and this is another thing that we're going to be looking. Uh, we want to look to clarify, hopefully before October 2020, a lot of, you know, we'll have better answers for for some of these questions. We talk about transfers and just just for a, a minute, I just want to say, you know, not all transfers, you know, there are certain transfers that people can make that are exempt. All right. There are exempt transfers from the Medicaid law, and these are unaffected uh, by this new change. All right. Uh, you can, for instance, you can transfer your homestead. You can transfer to a spouse, to a disabled child of any age, uh, to a caretaker child who's been living there. Uh, prior to, uh, I guess, your application. Uh, it, right now it says institutionalization, but if it applies to home care, it would have to apply 
to to a home care situation as well. Uh, also, uh, you could transfer to a, a sibling with equity interest in the home uh, who has been living there. So, so there are certain transfers that that are uh, that are permitted under the law. Uh, the other thing that you can do is, is uh, Moira mentioned, a supplemental needs trust. All right, a supplemental needs trust. A first party supplemental needs trust. You can create one of those if you're eight, under age 65 and, uh, and there would be no penalty for that. Okay, there would be no penalty for a transfer to a supplemental needs trust. It's, it's provided for under uh, the, the federal law. Um, there's also something called a pooled income trust, uh, which is a, a kind of supplemental needs trust, uh, but it's run by a not-for-profit agency. Now, those uh, transfers uh, are permitted if you're under 65, but if you're over age 65, um, it, again, it's not quite clear, but it would potentially, uh, it, it may potentially result in, in a penalty period. Again, we're looking for clarification relating to that. So um, we will look to, you know, we will look to get more information relating to that. Um, so uh, now I think we can move to the next slide. I'm sorry. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is this new activities of daily living requirement. Uh, this was never required before. Uh, those of you who have long-term care insurance uh, may be familiar with the term. Uh, it, it's key to to getting coverage in in long term care insurance situations. Uh, they usually require you know two act assistance with two activities of daily living. So now Medicaid is going to require that. Medicaid is only prior to this they've only looked for uh, assisted you know, medically necessary services. All right, but now they're going to say, well, you, you need assistance with two activities of daily living. Um, and uh, if you have a diagnosis of dementia, you then only need assistance with one, because I guess the, the dementia uh, requires a care component as well. So uh, this is gonna be, uh, this is gonna be the new law. It's effective October, 2020, again. Um, now there, there is no real um, definition of, of what, this activities of daily living are uh, they're they're in some of these insurance policies, but there's no Medicaid guidance on what an activity of daily living is. Uh, there are a lot of regulations that talk about what people need assistance with, but it's not clearly defined. Uh, but this is what we generally understand to be the the activities of daily living: eating, dressing, bathing. Transferring that means getting out in and out of bed or going anywhere, getting into a wheelchair potentially, uh, toileting, and continence. All right, these these are are generally understood to be the activities activities of daily living, and people will need assistance with two of those or one if they have dementia uh, in order to qualify for Medicaid long term care services. The assessment thing is also is also critical. All right, it's, it's an important thing to talk about because assessments determine how many hours of care or what kind of care people receive. Uh, usually, uh, to do a Medicaid application, you have to submit a, a physician recommendation, uh, and and then a, a nurse will will come out and, and do an assessment and develop a plan of care. And that plan of care will determine how many hours you get, whether you know you just need a couple of hours of care, five hours of care, or you need somebody round the clock, all right? Uh, so this determination is usually based upon a plan of care developed by a nurse. Um, and, and in the past, it's been done by, uh, you know, a number of different agencies. There, there's what's called the conflict conflict free assessment which just gets you into the program in the first place and then there there would be a, a home care assessment by a nursing uh, agency a nurse who, uh, working for an agency now um, under the new law and, and this is uh, under the new law there's it's two parts or it's really more it's really three uh, under the new, new law there's going to be a new tool there's going to be a new tool that determines uh, how cases are assessed. All right, there's going to be 
uh, it's like a questionnaire. It goes, you know, it's a check the boxes kind of thing. And, it, you know, it's done online. There's one now that is, is in place. Um, but uh, the, the team has recommended that a new one, a new one based on tasks, all right, task based. What do people need help with? All right, what what do people need help with? That's that's what a task is, and and we refer to the the activities of daily living. All right, the activities of daily living. Uh, if if you need help with any of those, that's a task. All right, that's a task. So um, the assessment tool would would be would be task based. And it's going to be developed by April 2021 uh, according to the law. So that so you would have to have this new assessment tool in place. Um, and there's also going to be a, a contractor statewide. One contractor, one agency will be taking over all, doing all of these assessments. All right. Uh, they're going to do, there's going to be a, a bid process or, or it's RFP process in order to develop this new, um, uh, to pick this new agency. Um, and the agency will then have this task based assessment tool and this is going to replace uh, all this whole network that we've had before of private physician recommendations, local public health nurses and home care uh, agency nursing assessments. Um, the, the idea is to have this, this contractor in place by uh, October 2022. All right. So they, there's. It's coming down the road a little bit. It's going to be about two years before a new contractor is in place. Uh, it's very, very possible that the contractor will be the same contractor that uh, that they use now, which is uh, Maximus. And, and Maximus uh, currently does the initial assessment uh, statewide. But what they they may take uh, they may since they already have uh, some of the, the structures in place. It's possible that they would uh, that they would win the bid and and continue as the the, the assessment agency. Uh, okay, so also there is uh, a new uh, with this new assessment process. They're only going to do it once a year. Currently, nur nursing assessments are done twice a year, but uh, but under the new law, uh, they only have to do it once a year. Uh, which means that there's going to be less contact. There's going to be less monitoring, uh, uh, oversight of home care. Um, you know, so that's something of concern. Now, if somebody's um, if somebody's health condition changes, there always is the the option to to send an, a nurse out to do a new assessment. All right. If if somebody has a a serious health condition that worsens, or or something that's emergent then then another assessment can be done but it's not going to be done routinely all right currently you just got this one once every six months somebody comes out to make sure that you still need the same level of care if you need more they can they can assign at that time um, but but now it's only going to be done once a year so so this is the last thing i'm going to cover uh today this is the the fourth major change in the medicaid program all right um the the home care and the consumer directed uh, personal assistance program, the CDPAP, which is this is the program that that allows you to hire your own aid. Uh, and, and you may have seen ads for that, you know, where, where you're allowed to even hire your family to, to act as your aid. Uh, you know, it's particularly helpful in, in places that are hard to get to where, where people don't have, uh, you know, with, where you don't have public transportation. So uh, the home care and the, and the consumer directed program. Uh, these cases are now going to be reviewed uh, and they're going to be uh, the ones that are that exceed a specified level of utilization. Uh, and, and as I mentioned before, the, the Medicaid redesign team said that would be 12 hours a day. Um, but we don't know if that's actually a, a recommendation that the commissioner will adopt. The, the commissioner uh, can set this level that to, to look at cases that will be that that exceed a certain level of utilization all right um so uh what's going to happen is that if they determine let's say it's 12 hours that you're getting more than 12 hours of, of care they can they're going to go look at these cases and who is they they is a separate 
medical review panel. All right, the, the, the law calls for the creation of a special medical review panel that's supposed to review cases. All right, and they and what are the cases they're going to look at? They're going to look at the cases that are high utilization. The people with 24 hour care there, uh, you know, like I said, maybe anybody o over 12 hours. We don't know for sure yet. But, uh, you know, people who are, are high utilizers, people who, who need a lot of care are going to be looked at. And, and what the law says is it, they're supposed to look at whether they're appropriate to still be receiving home care. Um, you know, so, you know, we really don't know what's going to happen. I mean, what does that mean? Well, you know, if you're getting if you're getting 24 hours of care and they suddenly say, well, you're not appropriate for that. Where are you going to go? All right. And, and the fear is that you would probably end up uh you, they they probably would say that a nursing home is is the only solution because if you need a lot of care there's really literally no other options um so uh you know this is very concerning um you know you'll have a met, an independent re review panel and and if they f feel like you're inappropriate if you're not appropriate to to be receiving home care because you're getting actually too much care because you're getting too much care and those those needs cannot be met in, in the home, uh, they're going to recommend that you go to a nursing home. Um, so we're very concerned about this change as well. Uh, and it certainly could affect uh, a lot of people uh, who, who are who need high levels of care. And, I, and that that's the major changes in in Medicaid. Um, and, uh, you know, there, there are a number of other programmatic changes, but they don't affect people as directly. These four will, will affect people directly. And I thank you for listening to me today. Oh, Deep, thank you so much for your for your presentation. I feel like this is my cheat sheet now for some of the changes that have that have taken place. I'm also actually going to pause right now to stop sharing this presentation deck. And instead, I'd like to uh, share an image of our website which is seniorlawday.info and I just have to make sure I get to the right screen to do that. Here we go. On the reason I'm taking you there is because on our website we have the ability we've actually posted the presentation deck that we have today uh, senior law day Info. I've been mentioning the site since the beginning of the program, but uh, you can click here for the slides that have been shared so far by our several presenters. And when we have video content, we'll also be posting that to this website as well. I'm not sure that you guys are getting the transmission for this, this thing as quickly as I'd like. There, there it goes. So seniorlawday.info. Is the is the website, and you can click here for the presentation, which will bring, which will give you all of the slides that you've seen so far. I realize they may be challenging to read on Facebook or on the television, but you can certainly print them out here. Also on the site, I will mention it now again that there is this Ask Us button that is here, and if you click on that button, you can follow up with questions with any of the presenters today. So I was showing off of off our website so that you could see that there were available slide. Um, slides from all of the materials that have been shared so far. Next up, we have we have um, a review of the critical advanced directives. And uh, our, our presenter, Sarah Myers, can now take the floor. Thank you, Elena, and thank you to all my prior speakers. Good morning, we're gonna be talking, my name's Sarah Myers, and we're gonna be talking about advanced directives. Advanced directives are a group of legal documents which contain the power of attorney, healthcare proxy and living will. Many people say, why do I need to sign a power of attorney, a healthcare proxy? I'm fine, I have capacity. I don't need one of those documents now. The point of having an advanced directive is being able to have a document that you sign now that will go into effect that's useful later if at a point in time that you no longer have capacity. So I'm doing my planning now, my advanced directives now, again, for that time where I'm unable to make my financial decisions, where I'm able to, unable to make my medical decisions, where I'm unable to make or give guidance as to my end of life decisions. And some people, I've always asked, what's the most important document 
to have. If you were to choose one document to go to a lawyer about, and without even thinking, I always say, it's the most important to have a power of attorney. Thank you, Elena, for the slide. A power of attorney is a document that says, if, on, if I am unable to handle my financial affairs, to pay my bills, to pay my taxes, to handle my real estate, to purchase real estate, to sign a contract, to sign a contract of sale, to sign a deed, to handle any type of financial arrangement, deal with my stockbroker, my, my brokerage account, my retirement accounts, I'm appointing somebody or people known as the agent or agents to handle my financial affairs for me when and if I'm no longer able to handle my financial affairs. So the, the document says, you know, I will use me as an example, Sarah Myers. I appoint somebody and I'll use my husband as the example, Kenny, to make financial decisions for me if I'm unable to do so for myself. The power of attorney can be incredibly broad and have a broad range of powers or very limited. So a lot of times, let's say I were selling my house and I wasn't, won't be able to attend the closing. I can give my attorney or someone else a power of attorney limited solely to handling a real estate transaction. But we prefer, we more like more often than not use a very broad power of attorney to allow for broad powers as well as broad gifting powers for to give to the agent from the principal. Um, in terms of broad powers, as attorneys and as attorneys to do trust and estates and elder law, we're always looking to see to do the what if for the eventualities. So we want to make sure that planning can be done, as my colleagues um, Maura and Deep spoke about, in terms of estate planning, really Medicaid planning and Medicaid applications, to enable the agent to assist with any type of uh, Medicaid application, signing an application, even signing a pooled trust application, which goes with a Medicaid application, to really look at the big picture to see to make sure any type of activity that I as the principal can do for myself, I'm allowing that agent to do for me as well. However, unless I as the principal allow my agent to make gifts of my assets that are in my best interest and sign an initial something called the statutory gifts rider, the agent is not allowed to make gifts of my assets. So the standard power of attorney, if a statutory gifts rider is not signed, is not part of the power of attorney, the agent appointed under that power of attorney is unable to make gifts of my assets. And again, a lot of people use that because they want their principal, the principal wants the agent to be able to assist with financial affairs, but not make any gifts. In terms of estate planning and elder law planning, especially, a lot of times we don't know what the future will bring there might be an asset in a person's name alone, and we want the agent to be able to have access to those assets to be able to do that Medicaid planning for that individual. So again, a power of attorney is a document that appoints an agent or multiple agents who can either act together or separately, depending on what the principal wishes, to handle that individual's financial affairs. Now, a power of attorney is limited to those assets that are, uh, my apologies, I'll step back for a second. The power of the agent under the power of attorney has the authority to handle those assets which are in the agent, the principal's name alone. So for example, if I have a bank account in my name alone and I no longer have the ability to write checks on the account to manage that account, the only person who can then access that account is the agent under a power of attorney. Because again, no one else has legal access to an account that's in my name alone. If an account that I have is joint with someone else, that joint account holder is an, an able to access that account. But again, if that account is in my name alone and I no longer have capacity, no one else has authority to access that account. And the question is, and I'm asked this a lot, so who should sign a power of attorney? Who should have a power of attorney? And you're going to laugh, but frankly, anyone over the age of 18 should have a power of attorney. And I'll tell you, I have a daughter who's 20. My oldest is 20 when she turned 18. What did we get her for her birthday? She came to my office and she signed a power of attorney and a healthcare proxy. 
My friends made fun of me, her friends made fun of her. But frankly, at 18, a child becomes an adult. And yes, we say they still do need parenting. However, we cannot make financial decisions for them without them. We can't make medical decisions for them without them. So anyone over the age of 18 should sign a power of attorney because again, we just don't know what the future will hold. And again, it is so important to be able to take control over, over something that you know, we just don't know because again, it's a peace of mind document. God forbid something happens. We know that there's a power of attorney there to enable that person to have, so that person will have appointed somebody to make those decisions. Unfortunately, a lot of people say, I don't need a power of attorney. I'm fine. There's nothing wrong with me. I don't want to give up control. So when a person has capacity, they're not giving up control. Again, they're doing that power of attorney for the future, not for now. Because God forbid someone doesn't have a power of attorney and they no longer have capacity, they're no longer able to handle their financial affairs. If their assets in that person's name alone, then the only recourse in order for someone to handle that, those per, that person's financial affairs is to go to court and do something called a mental hygiene law article 81 guardianship, which is a court proceeding and frankly, rather expensive. So we say to people, we, we can sort of weigh the cost. How much is it, how much time does it take to sign a power of attorney vis-a-vis -vis your loved ones while they're you're in an emergency situation or a slow moving, you know, unfortunately neurological disease, they have to go to court while they're in the middle of taking care of you. So it's so important to be prepared to have the, the toolkit that God forbid you should become incapacitated. The next, the next slide, please, Elena. The next document that it's so important to have is a healthcare proxy. A healthcare proxy is a document that said that says, if I'm unable to handle my medical affairs, doctor, medical provider, I want you to speak to and get guidance from my spouse, child, friend, loved one. And I'm appointing that person who the medical professionals should speak to in terms of making medical decisions for me if I'm unable. In New York State, you can only have one agent appointed at a time. And unfortunately, I see many healthcare proxies that a, a new client will provide, and it says, and I want my three children to make medical decisions for me. And I say, well, what's the doctor supposed to do? You're in a medical emergency. We need to make medical decisions. How do I know who I'm taking direction from? Or what if you and your siblings aren't in agreement? So the healthcare proxy statute, which is found in the public health law, says one agent at a time. So I'm appointing my daughter, Gabrielle. In the alternative, I'm appointing my next daughter. In the alternative, I'm appointing my son. You, should, you can have a list and alternatives, but only one person can speak for you at a time and always that primary person first when making medical decisions for you if you can't. So, so many seniors say to me, well, I don't want my children making medical decisions. I can make them for myself. And I say, yes, remember, because these are called advanced directives. These are directives and documents for when it comes that time where you are unable to make those medical decisions for yourself. And frankly, it's giving your family members and friends and loved ones guidance as to who you are appointed. And I think it's very important because people say, no, no, I don't want to talk to my spouse about this. I don't want to talk to my children about this. But it's important for your family members to know who you are designating. So when unfortunately there becomes a period of crisis or a period of medical need, they know what your wishes are and who that person is that should be making decisions as opposed to people fighting over who wants to make that decision or who you, they think you would have wanted to make that decision for you. So it's so important to have clear communication with the, the agents you're choosing under both the power of attorney and the healthcare proxy, because they're the ones who are going to be metaphorically stepping into your shoes to make those decisions for you. Now, the next slide, please, is about a living will. So a living will is another type of advanced directive. And the living will is there's actually no legal statutory framework in New York State for a living will. So what is a living will? A living will is a document that's evidence to what your end of life wishes are. 
if you, for example, are, are, you know, are in a vegetative or comatose state and you're unable to breathe on your own, do you want mechanical respiration? If you're going into cardiac failure, do you want cardiac resuscitation or tube feeding? So it's evidence of what your wishes are if you're in a vegetative or comatose state and unable to make those decisions for yourself. And a living will says for the most part, if I'm in a vegetative or comatose state with no chance of recovery, I don't want mechanical respiration. I don't want cardiac resuscitation. I don't want tube feeding. I do want maximum pain relief because I don't want any heroic measures. Please just let me be and let nature take its course. So as I said a, a couple of minutes ago, that there's no statutory framework for a living will in New York State. So why should a person have one? Because in a situation I've just described, the doctor or medical professional is going to look toward to the agent under the healthcare proxy and want to know about what your wishes are in terms of end of life care. And if the agent under the healthcare proxy doesn't know what your wishes are, then the doctors will do mechanical respiration, a ventilator, CPR, cardiac resuscitation, tube feeding, and will use all heroic measures and to try to sustain life. So the living will is evidence to the healthcare proxy of what those end of life wishes are. I also see it as reassurance and guidance to the healthcare proxy because anyone having to make end of life decisions he or she is always going to question himself or herself. Is this what my, my spouse wanted? Is this what my parent wanted? Is this what my loved one wanted? And are other family members going to question that agent and say, well, this isn't what mom wanted. This isn't what dad wanted. So it's so important to be able to give that loved one direction as to what your wishes are, because it also, frankly, a little bit obviates the guilt a person might have in terms of making those decisions if they know they're making those decisions for you, which is what your decisions are. So you're basically giving them comfort in these very critical, very end, of, you know, end stage lifetimes of what the direction is. And it's saying, it's okay, this is what my wishes are. Which is why, again, it's so important to have an advanced directive. And again, we, we lump these three documents, the power of attorney, healthcare proxy, living will, into a category of advanced directives because you need to be able to understand them and to sign them prior to loss of capacity while you still are able to make your financial decisions, your medical decisions, your end of life decisions. Because again, you know, my, my partner always laughs at me. There's a Yiddish expression that says, man plans, God laughs. And it's true though, we wanna be able to do as much planning as we can. So frankly, our loved one will never have to use the power of attorney. They'll never have to use the healthcare proxy. We won't have to make end of life decisions. But unfortunately, as we know, sometimes God is laughing and we do need to have somebody make those decisions for us. So we might as well have in our toolbox those directives because that way we've made, you know, we've, we've organized it for our, loves, our, our loved ones, our family members. So in a time of crisis, or long-term incapacity, everybody knows what your wishes are, who you've directed, right? Who you've directed to make those financial, medical, end of life decisions and let them worry about you and being the parent, the child, the friend, the loved one, and not have to worry about how decisions are going to be made because you've taken care of all of that for them. So again, it's so important in your toolbox to have these directives because again, it, it provides the necessary direction to the agent, to your loved one. Wow, Sarah, thank you for this clear, direct review of what it means to actually do advanced, advanced directives and advanced planning. And clearly it's informed by, by um, substantial experience with, with a number of families and individuals. And now we have a new idea for turning 18 birthday gift. Much appreciated. <laughs> Anytime. <laughs> Thank you again. So next Go up, on. next up, we have a, a message from Roberta Goodman, who is the um, an attorney at a at the Pace Women's Justice Center. And I'll ask my uh, colleague George to George Quince to please uh, start that video. Good 
morning. I am Roberta Goodman. I am one of the staff attorneys at the Pace Women's Justice Center in White Plains. We are proud to be a partner with the Senior Law Day program. The Pace Women's Justice Center serves both men and women, and we provide free civil legal services to victims and survivors of domestic violence, elder abuse, and sexual assault, not just during COVID. Most of us have been sheltering in place since the governor's executive order was issued. Some of us have become fearful and tense because family members or others may be with us creating an unsafe environment. Or perhaps they're using your money and property without your permission. Could be a relative, could be a caretaker, or it could be a stranger on the phone who is looking to separate you from your property. We are here to help you be safe, whether it's in family court, getting an order of protection, accessing legal solutions, and by helping you to plan and protect what you own. To speak with one of our attorneys, call us at 914-287-0739. Be safe, and we hope to see you soon. Bye. Thank you. So we, we figured who better to share that message than someone from the Pace Women's Justice Center about that, about that important topic. So the, ne the next up, we, ha we have um, the, a representative from the Yonkers Public Library who has been our um, stalwart partner in providing and bringing this program to Yonkers for the last couple of years. We've been doing it throughout Westchester County for more than 20 years, but we're delighted to be able to actually ground this in Yonkers, in the, in the Yonkers community. So Alan, I hope you're ready to tell us about the services you need to know about now. <laughs> Thank you, Elena, I am. Um, as she mentioned, uh, my name is Alan Housen, and I am a uh, I'm the programming librarian for special populations at the Will Branch of the Yonkers Public Library. And uh, first, before anything, uh, I would like to thank everybody involved in the production of this broadcast. Uh, uh, we are always thrilled to host uh, Senior Law Day, uh, and um, we're always thrilled to be a part of this uh, very important program. And we're particularly pleased that it all came together so well today under uh, these pretty extraordinary circumstances. That's a true testament to the hard work of everybody involved, and we're just happy to be a part of it. Um, and we are definitely looking forward to an in-person, <laughs> a return to an in-person uh, event next year. Uh, for the last uh, two months, while our doors have been closed, uh, really everybody at the library has been working hard to uh, create and present virtual programs just like this one. And uh, I think if you look uh, at our calendar on our website, uh, which is www.ypl.org, um, you can see on most days we have a full lineup of uh, online offerings. And I just wanna mention a couple of things that we have going on uh, that may be of particular interest to uh, older adults. Uh, the first one uh, was one of the first things we did uh, when uh, the pandemic struck. We uh, developed this uh, senior chat time, which we are kind of referring to as a 21st century party line. Um, but it's a very informal drop in conversation uh, on Zoom uh, every Tuesday and Thursday at 11 o'clock. Uh, and if you do not feel comfortable with uh, Zoom or using Zoom, you can always call in. Uh, again, if you check our website, you will find the uh, address to the Zoom program and the phone number that you call. We are always looking for new people, and uh, we really encourage anybody uh, just to drop in, tell us what's going on. Uh, we talk a lot about resources that are available, uh, and uh, just it's, it's a really nice chance to kind of get to know uh, your neighbors in the city. Um, if you, uh, again, if you are not feeling comfortable using Zoom and you want to learn more about Zoom or you have any other tech questions, uh, the library is here to help. And uh, we now have available a 45 minute uh, help desk session with our uh, tech help desk that you can make an appointment for 48 hours in advance uh, if you 
uh, again, check our website. You can find out information about that. That service runs Monday through Friday from nine to four. Uh, and additionally, we have a number of Zoom based computer classes to help you learn how to use uh, the library's ebook and streaming services, as well as things like Microsoft Word, Excel, Google Docs, Sheets. Uh, again, if you check our uh, calendar, you will see the list of programs that we have available. A lot of them are computer programs, and we do have a drop in tech help uh, as well. Uh, again, check our website. Um, we also have programs that have nothing to do with technology. And uh, Kelly had previously mentioned a couple of new programs that we have. Um, Z from the, Quest, the Crestwood Library and Sally Pinto from the Yonkers Nork have started an online bingo program. Uh, that is on Thursdays at 1 o'clock, and we also have a meditation and chair yoga program uh, that is on Wednesdays at 9 a.m. Uh, and I, th I think it's safe to say now that we're in June. Um, the we are going to begin resuming our library by mail homebound delivery service. Uh, which had been suspended through this period of uh, shelter in place. Uh, if, for the moment, the materials that we can lend are limited to what we have in the building as uh, all countywide interlibrary loan services are still suspended. Uh, but if you are already uh, in the program, or if you are interested in more information and would like to join this program and receive materials by mail uh, through homebound delivery, you can uh, you can call me. Uh, my number is 914-337-1500, extension 322, or you can email the address that is on the slide uh, there, homebound at ypl.org. Uh, the Two other, there are two other projects that uh, we are working on that we're particularly excited about. Um, one of them is a project to document uh, the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, for some time now, our digital archivist, uh, Mike Walsh at the Will Library has been collecting oral histories from Yonkers residents and um, we're trying to build a, a kind of database of, of local experience in of Yonkers residents, uh, but we thought it was important to devote particular attention to documenting our lives during this particularly extraordinary period. And we uh, would like to invite really everybody to participate in an interview, and this would be a Zoom based interview. Uh, to share your experiences of being uh, in Yonkers during the pandemic, uh, really kind of talk a little bit about how your life has changed and maybe what you would want future generations to know about this time and what it was like living in Yonkers um, as a Yonkers resident. The other project is something called Vision Labs, which is a joint project uh, between the Westchester Library System and the Yonkers Public Library aimed at addressing the needs of low vision and the visually impaired adults. It's uh, designed to provide Westchester residents with access to magnifying technology, as well as information about resources and support services that uh, are available to help you deal with low vision. Uh, and vision loss. And uh, really what we want to do is, is help you keep reading for a lifetime over the course of your life. And um, if you would like more information on that, you can also uh, telephone me, 914-337-1500. Uh, uh, extension 322, or you can email uh, the email address is outreach, uh, so that's O U T R E A C H at W L S M A I L dot org. So that is outreach at W L S dot org. 
uh, we will again have uh, more information for you if you uh, want to inquire. Uh, but we're very excited about that. And uh, two final notes, general kind of library notes. Uh, the Yonkers Public Library Foundation's annual fundraiser uh, will still be held as a virtual event, much like this, uh, on Wednesday, June 10th at 7 p.m. And it will feature acclaimed author Julia Alvarez. And uh, I would encourage you to uh, check out the uh, foundation's website which is foundation for YPL.org uh, for more details about the event and uh, to register. There is no cost, uh, but it is a fundraiser uh, and we do uh, hope that uh, you will register in advance. And lastly, uh, I do want to note that both the Will uh, branch and the Riverfront branch of the Yonkers Library will be early voting sites for the upcoming presidential primary election. And this runs from June 13th to June 21st. So both buildings will uh, be early voting sites for the upcoming primary. And I, uh, I think if you take anything from this, uh, really just uh, visit our website uh, for more information. Uh, that's www.ypl.org. And again, I really, um, Think this was an extraordinary event and I'm glad we were all able to put this together and I again I really look forward to hosting uh, a live event uh, next next June. Thank you so much Alan and I just want to underscore how excited uh, I am and Westchester Library System is to be partnering with the Yonkers Public Library on the Vision Labs project. I hope you will I hope we'll have some more to share about this in the coming in the coming weeks and months. But also, I want to call out that Yonkers is, um, you know, a library that uh, has has a couple of branches and is doing phenomenal work. Like our, as are many of a, of the libraries in the Westchester Library System. So please, I hope everyone is checking out their local libraries' websites and keeping track of when they're able to reopen and what they're. There are very many creative things that are being done now to fill to fill the gap when, when our when our doors are, are not yet open. So. We've now had the annual Yonkers, the third annual Yonkers Senior Law Day event uh, in this uh, abbreviated two hour format uh, with it's where I'm feeling, I think we're all feeling sort of the sense of missing being able to be with everyone, but we're excited to be able to capture these key messages and make them available on our website in the future. So what's your next step? I hope you take away that you should be going to the Yonkers to, to Yonkers to, to the Yonkers Public Library site as well as to seniorlawday.info. That site, which I am going to again show you, has a number of features that I think are especially important right now. So on our website, seniorlawday.info, I want you to remember there is an Ask Us button. When you click on that button, you get a pop-up window that um, just asks you for some, some basic contact information and we will get back to you by email or phone within within two business days. So this is how you ask follow-up questions of the people that spoke today and, and many others in our collaborative. All of the presentation slides that were shared today are posted here and I wanna call out two other things. This is a um, video of Karen Ra Rowan who um, spoke earlier showing us how to properly wear a mask and gloves and we have a curated page of resources specific to the COVID-19 challenges. And this is, uh, we, we're constantly updating this. These are the key phone numbers. These are key resources for you to keep informed and for you to, for you to get additional assistance. And you go all the way through, many of them are available in Spanish <clears throat> and there are resources for how to know about scams and how to research things that are that, that that people are telling you that are important to know about during during this this whole crisis and if you forgot to wash your hands we've also linked to a couple of videos that um, can make sure that you that you re remember that I'm going to stop this screen and I'm going to go right back to our closing slide so again we want you to go to, to seniorlawday.info and ask us a question and you can also leave us a message by by phone if you don't have a computer available to you. It's 914-231-3227. That is the phone number for our outreach department. And if you leave a message, we will get back to you just as soon as we can. Finally, uh, just 
I wanted to say thank you to every participant. I hope you are all aware or you have a sense after after viewing this of the, the, the clarity and the knowledge and the heart that goes into, into delivering these services. And I look forward to seeing you next year live and in person.